Carl Sagan once wrote that, for small creatures such as we, the vastness of the cosmos is bearable only through love. If the characters we meet in the TV series and films of the Star Trek franchise are any indication, Carl was right on the money, because for the last almost 60 years, they have been hooking up nonstop. There are so many couples in Star Trek, from long-term relationships to doomed romances to single-episode flings, and I thought it would be fun, being that this video is scheduled to drop on Valentine's Day and all, to spend some time trying to answer the question, who are actually Star Trek's best and worst couples? My previous Trek Actually video was about best friends from throughout the Star Trek franchise, and in that one, I tried to select one representative pair of BFFs from each iteration of Star Trek to focus on. That was a challenge, because there are lots of memorable best friends from the many versions of Star Trek, and inevitably there were quite a few BFFs to whom I was forced to pay minimal attention, and some that I left out altogether. But when the subject is romantic pairings, the number of potential examples is even more astronomical than with BFFs. So, with your permission, or without it, doesn't make a difference at this point, the video is done, this time I'd like to take a different approach. Beginning with the original series, I'll pick out the most memorable romantic pairings from each version of Star Trek and place them into one of two categories. They will either be one of Star Trek's best couples, or one of Star Trek's worst couples. But Steve, you may ask, what about the so-so couples, who are neither among the best nor the worst? And to that I say, can you think of one? If you can, would you call them a memorable couple? Because to me personally, if they aren't clearly on one side or the other of the best worst line, that doesn't sound like they're worth mentioning in a video like this. But if you disagree, and I leave somebody out that you think I should have included? That's why God created the comment section. Good and bad romance is such an essential ingredient in Star Trek that we find it in the very first episode ever produced. The original pilot, The Cage. Worst, Captain Pike and Vina. Nothing against either character, but the plot of the cage involves Captain Pike being abducted by aliens who use telepathically projected illusions to attempt to force Pike and Vina together as a breeding pair to create more humans. I know, I know, that's how your parents met, right? Mine too. And yet I still find it kind of gross. Sure, by the end of the episode, it seems like Pike and Vina have begun to genuinely care about each other. Vina, in particular, seems sweet on Pike. And when the two characters encounter each other again in the Star Trek Discovery episode, If Memory Serves, which is set a few years after The Cage, there's a note of wistful longing to their interaction, but it doesn't negate the fact that their starting point as a couple was some weird aliens trying to brainwash them into making babies. And call me old-fashioned if you must, but I just don't think that's the foundation of a healthy relationship. Best. Captain Kirk and Edith Keeler. Ah, the star-crossed lovers of the city on the edge of forever. Like Romeo and Juliet. Except Romeo lives and Benvolio tries to save Juliet, but Romeo stops him. Which makes Spock... who? Friar Lawrence? I may have to work on that one. Anyway, it's destined to end unhappily. It's rushed, to say the least, but I'll be damned if I'm not buying into it by the time the story reaches its climax. A time-traveling Kirk falls in love with a 1930s charity worker, Edith, with her beauty, her idealism, her uncannily forward-thinking philosophy, but must allow her to die in a car accident in order to reset the timeline to its rightful state. The romance doesn't last very long, but Kirk at least considers sacrificing the whole last future of planet Earth so that Edith might live. And that, my friends, is love. Worst, Kirk and Miramani. This one might be slightly controversial. I bet some of you would object to me calling this one for the worst category, since for the time they are together, Kirk and Miramani do seem genuinely happy. 
But the episode in which this romance occurs, the Paradise Syndrome, is a jumble of noble savage and white savior cliches. The character of Miramani only exists to serve the story of Kirk, who loses his memory and is able to finally escape the pressures of being a starship captain, only to regain his memory and have to leave his new life behind, which is just as well, since once the narrative has no more need for her, they kill off Miramani anyway. Edith Keeler, dead. Miramani, dead. I'm starting to think dating Captain Kirk is a bad idea. Worst, Spock and T'Pring. Amok Time is my favorite original series episode, and it wouldn't be nearly so great if Spock and T'Pring weren't such a terrible couple. Looking for a way out of her arranged marriage to Spock, T'Pring invokes a form of ritual combat and chooses Captain Kirk to be her champion in a fight to the death against Spock. Arranging a deathmatch between your fiancé and his best friend to create a pretext for dumping him is not the act of someone in a healthy relationship. Though I have to say, speaking as a disinterested third party, T'Pring's gambit is kind of brilliant. Spock won the fight and dumped T'Pring just like she wanted, but if Kirk had won the fight, he wouldn't have wanted to marry her either, so no matter what the outcome, she got what she wanted. What an impressive woman. That Stan sure is a lucky guy. Assuming he survived. Best, Spock and Lila. I know what you're gonna say. How can I put Pike and Vina in the worst column because their relationship was based on mind control and then put Spock and Lila in the best column when their relationship in this side of paradise is also based on a kind of mind control as they're both under the influence of the spores of that flower that sneezes in people's faces. I have two rebuttals to that objection. First, Spock and Lila knew each other already from years before, and it's apparently the case that the spores merely allowed Spock to loosen up and express his love for Lila, which was already there, rather than the spores compelling them to love each other when no natural love was there. Second, it's my goddamn video, and I'll sort the Star Trek couples into any categories that suit me. I just invented a new category called Sexiest Couple, where at least one of them dresses in overalls. And Spock and Lila aren't in it, but Zephram Cochran and the Companion are. Because I said so. What are you gonna do? Anyway, Spock and Lila seem really happy together, and when the spell of the spores has been broken and Spock returns to his life on the Enterprise, he describes having to leave Lila as a self-made purgatory, and tells Kirk that his brief stay on the planet with Lila was the first time in his life that he had been happy. Ain't that a kick in the teeth? Speaking figuratively. Don't try that on Spock, you'll break a toe on those fucking things. Moving on now to the Star Trek original series movies, Worst, Commander Decker and Ilea, Star Trek The Motion Picture. Because that's not actually Ilea. That's a robot that looks like Ilea and has her memories that was constructed by V'ger, which killed the real Ilea, and Decker still had the hots for her. Falling in love with a robot that looks like his ex-girlfriend, built by the being that murdered his ex-girlfriend. That's deeply messed up. I just get a bad vibe off this Decker guy. I look at him and think, you know... He might not be a good person. Worst, Scotty and Uhura, Star Trek V. Where did this come from? Did Shatner decide he wanted some romance between two members of the supporting cast and pull two names out of a hat? I'm not saying there's no way this could have been handled well. I'm just saying the way it is handled in the movie feels forced and phony, and it's more than slightly jarring to have Scotty and Uhura just show up in the fifth movie in the series like, oh, we're fucking, by the way, and we've been fucking. Good for them, I guess? Though apparently they break up sometime after the movie and agree on a let us never speak of this again policy going forward because by the time Star Trek VI rolls around a couple of years later, it's like it never even happened. Best, Kirk and Carol Marcus, and I'm talking specifically just about the bit of their relationship we actually see in Star Trek II. Things apparently weren't so great back in the day, since they broke up and Carol decided she wanted to raise their son, David, without any involvement from Kirk. But when they reconnect following Khan's escape from exile, there's obviously still a deep reservoir of love and affection between them, and despite some occasional tension, they complement each other very well. And it's easy to imagine that back in the day, when things were good between them, they were very good. 
on to Star Trek The Next Generation, and let's start out on a high note. Best, Worf and Kalar, the Emissary Reunion. Yes, if we abide by the biblical doctrine of by their fruits, you shall know them. These two are automatically in the worst column. But I would argue that we waive that rule in this case. Plus, I'm an atheist. What do I care what the Bible says? Anyway, their son may be one of the most insufferable characters in the entire franchise, but judged by themselves, Worf and Kalar are a pretty awesome couple. They play off of each other nicely, Worf's uptight commitment to Klingon tradition clashing with Kalar's more dismissive, don't give me that Klingon nonsense attitude, and making the sparks fly, baby. They've got all the ingredients needed for a classic couple, simmering romantic and sexual tension, a reunion after a long separation, contrasting personalities that find each other irresistible, holodeck sex, a child one of them doesn't know about, and involvement in political intrigue that leads to one of them getting murdered and the other carrying out a revenge killing. It's just like a Cole Porter song. Worst, Dr. Crusher and Ronan the Sex Ghost, Sub Rosa. How sad is it for Beverly Crusher that in six seasons of TNG, her most memorable love interest is an alien pretending to be a ghost who was just fucking her grandma? To be clear, he was pretending to be a ghost. He was actually fucking Beverly's grandma until recently when grandma died. He was also using grandma's body as a host, which his species needs to do in order to survive. And he was planning on doing the same with Beverly, hence all the sex, to get on her good side. But eventually, Beverly sees through his scheme and kills him after destroying the candle he lived in. This is an actual episode. Best, Captain Picard and Vosh, Captain's Holiday, Cupid. I'm not saying they should have gotten married. I'm not even saying they should have had more than two episodes together. But for what they were, Picard and Vosh were a great couple. Vosh shows up, they have an adventure together, smash if they have time, and then they go off on their separate ways. It seems like a good arrangement. Plus, Vash's underhanded and deceptive qualities serve to remind us that, despite his pretensions to propriety, Picard is a swashbuckling adventure hero at heart. And that's always fun. Worst, Data and Tasha Yar, the naked now. They were both fucked up on super space cooties. They hooked up. It was what it was. It's probably best forgotten. But then, Tasha gets slimed to death by Armis and Skin of Evil, and Data winds up keeping a little hologram of Tasha in his desk and carrying a sad robo-torch for her. She wasn't your girlfriend, Data. You were a dildo chair with a head to her. Time to move on, man. Best, Data and Jenna, in theory. That's what I'm talking about! Lieutenant Jenna DeSora, unlucky in love, finds herself attracted to Data, and Data decides, you know what, I'm gonna go for it. I'm gonna do my research and write some new programming for myself, and I'm gonna be the best boyfriend ever, and he is. He's supportive, he's attentive, he makes an honest effort to meet her needs, he even makes allowances for the occasional lover's quarrel leading to one of the funniest scenes ever on a Star Trek show. Perhaps there is something wrong with you! But like a brilliant supernova that illuminates the galaxy for a short time only to collapse into a cold, dark neutron star, Data and Jenna's relationship lasts but a brief moment. It wasn't destined to endure. She's still on the rebound after a long-term relationship. He's an emotionless automaton. You know how it goes. At least, they'll always have the torpedo bay. Worst, Jordy and Leia Holobrom's booby trap. Two characters thrown together by a stressful situation who find themselves attracted to each other. It's a time-tested setup for romance. Jack and Annie in Speed. Jack and Rose in Titanic. Jack and everything in Torchwood. So I'm told. I've never actually watched Torchwood. I'm still working my way through Doctor Who, so I kind of get it, but really I just needed a third Jack for that line. Anyway, point is, Jordy and Leah hollow Brahms falling in love while they race to save the Enterprise from an ancient alien booby trap is well in line with the conventions of both romance and adventure fiction. The problem is, the episode first reestablishes that Jordy is O for infinity with actual women, so when he develops an attachment to the holographic recreation of Dr. Leah Brahms, it feels like the desperate act of a deeply lonely person. 
Then again, Desperate Acts of a Deeply Lonely Person seems like the perfect title for Geordie's autobiography, so at least it's in character. Best, Captain Picard and Anij, Star Trek Insurrection. Look, everybody, a love interest for Captain Picard, who's only 20 years younger than Patrick Stewart. Okay, technically in the movie, the character is basically immortal and is much, much older than Picard, but I gotta get my cheap shots against beloved actors in where I can. Anij and Picard are a good match for each other. They're both leaders. They're both eloquent and philosophical. Picard loves archaeology, and she's older than dirt, but extremely well-preserved. And at the end of the movie, they do the classic adventure series Hero Farewell, where Picard's like, I have to go because duty calls, but I promise someday I'll be back. And then he never comes back, because they only did one more movie, and I guess Anij wasn't popular enough to ride the fan service express when it took off 20 years later. Ah, well. Hopefully she settled down with McCormick and they're both doing fine. Worst, Worf and Counselor Troy throughout Season 7 of TNG. Start with a Worf, end with a Worf. That's called symmetry. What were they thinking with this one? The concept of a Worf and Troy romance is introduced in the episode Parallels from about halfway through Season 7, when Worf finds himself in an alternate reality where he and Counselor Troy are married, and after that, Apparently, the writers said, hey, you know that Worf Troy thing we did to create a down is up, what even is this world feeling for that Parallel Universe episode? Let's do that for real. And they did. And it felt contrived and arbitrary, and I didn't buy it for a second. And even though they went out of their way to include it in the series finale, by the time the first TNG movie came out later that same year, it had been completely forgotten, never to be mentioned again, except when Marina Sirtis does Q&As at conventions, which is as it should be. Deep Space Nine! Let's keep it moving! Best! Captain Sisko and Captain Cassidy Yates! At first glance, Ben Sisko might seem an unlikely candidate to be the first lead protagonist of a Star Trek series to have a recurring long-term love interest. He's a widowed single father whose first wife, Jennifer, was killed in a Borg attack. He's carrying a lot of emotional baggage. He's a reluctant messianic figure to a population just starting to emerge from a brutal decades-long military occupation by hostile aliens. He's a diehard baseball fan. That's a lot. But Cassidy proves herself Ben's equal in toughness and determination. She likes his food and digs his new haircut. And most importantly of all, she loves baseball too. It's a match made in heaven. Or should I say, the heavens. Be because they're in space. Worst, Major Kira and Vedic Baril. <laughs> the one where he dies is good though. Best, Worf and Jadzia Dax. Of all the romances we've ever seen in Star Trek, Worf and Jadzia might be the most like an actual relationship. We see them growing closer bit by bit, evolving from colleagues to friendly acquaintances to co-workers who flirt to boyfriend and girlfriend to husband and wife to widower and corpse. Too soon, they squabble, they make fun of each other, they sacrifice for one another, they fuck to the point of mutual injury, they take a vacation where one of them has a good time and the other is so miserable he almost joins the Republican Party. It's a level of realism you don't often see in a Star Trek show. Worst, Major Kira and Shakar. <laughs> the one where it's revealed they broke up off screen is good though. Best, Chief O'Brien and Keiko. You know what makes Chief O'Brien and Keiko such a great couple? They support each other. She moves with him when he's transferred to a junker of a space station out in the boonies. He helps her set up a school on said junker space station when she can't find anything else to do with herself all day. And they give each other space. She lets him spend time drinking and playing darts and cosplaying with his best friend. He lets her go on an extended scientific expedition where she probably cheats on him with that Sabar guy. The important thing isn't how messed up their kids are going to be when they grow up. The important thing is it works.
Worst, Garrick and Zial. I'm not sure why the writers of DS9 felt like Garrick needed a love interest in the first place, and even assuming he did, I'm not sure why they decided to pair Garrick, one of the most fascinating and distinctive characters on the show, with Zial, a character so nondescript most viewers don't even register that she's played by three different actors. They never quite actually become a couple, but Zial falls for Garrick initially because they're the only two Cardassians living on the station, and I guess she figures, what the hell? Garrick never really seems sure what to do with her, and neither do the writers, and they kill her off near the beginning of season six, and it's just as well. It was bound to end in tears one way or the other. We know where Garrick's heart truly lies. Best, Bashir and Lita. Most of Bashir's romances are either unrequited or creepy or toxic in some way, so it's nice to be able to point to one that, in contrast to those others, seems fairly healthy. They even have a positive breakup experience, joining Worf and Dax on that aforementioned vacation where Worf briefly becomes an anti-SJW culture warrior. Bashir and Lita had a final fling, they expressed their appreciation for each other and the time they'd spent together, and parted as friends. How mature. How enlightened. How amazing must the sex have been. Worst, Bashir and Ezri. It's not so much that Bashir and Ezri are a terrible couple per se, it's just that they don't get together until the very end of the series, and what with Bashir having pursued Jadzia, Ezri's former self, so aggressively in the early years of the show, it feels like the writers just kind of throwing their hands up and going with the most obvious option. Ah, the show's almost over, and we killed off Jadzia, so we might as well pair off Bashir with her replacement. It evokes a similar feeling to Riker and Troy marrying each other at the start of Star Trek Nemesis, the creative equivalent of, ah, what the hell. Feels like both characters deserved better than to be tied off together like a pair of loose threads. Best, Rom and Lita, a fan-favorite couple, and why shouldn't they be? Not only is the start of their relationship an adorable and funny twist on the old will-they-or-won't-they trope, their enduring romance demonstrates that forming a lasting connection with another person is about more than the superficial considerations. It doesn't matter that one of them isn't conventionally attractive, that they don't have the right height or shape or fashion sense. Rom loves Lita anyway. Best, Major Kira and Odo. Talk about a well-crafted, long-running love story. Kira and Odo are established as close friends early on in the series. It's revealed that Odo is in love with Kira midway through season three. The timing doesn't work out for a few more years. Kira's dating other people. Kira learns about Odo's feelings for her after a future version of Odo wipes out the existence of thousands of people in order to save her, which makes things weird for a little while. Then Odo seeing other people. Then they finally get together near the end of season six. And then at the end of the series, they have to separate so Odo can rejoin his people in the wide Sargusso Sea of his home planet. It's a complete arc of a love story involving two series regulars that spans the entire series, and it's compelling and joyous and tragic and all in all pretty good. Star Trek Voyager. Here we go. Worst. Neelix and Kess. She's two years old. It's gross. I know, I know. Her species ages differently. She's two, going on 25. The fact that I even have to say that is gross. You're gross. And Neelix is overbearing and overprotective and just an all-around shitty boyfriend. At least Kess finally got away. How I envy her. Worst, Chakotay and Seven. Hey, the writers of Voyager saw the randomly selected romances between Uhura and Scotty and Worf and Troy and said, we can beat that. And they did. Not only is the pairing of Chakotay and Seven even more out of nowhere than those aforementioned couples, it also exists within a well of apathy so deep that it might have been powerful enough to tear a hole in the very fabric of the cosmos had their relationship existed for longer than a single episode. I remember watching Endgame, the series finale of Voyager, for the first time, seeing the sudden and inexplicable romance between Chakotay and Seven, and thinking... If I cared about any of this, I'd find it confusing. Why are they doing this? Which actually made me somewhat nostalgic. It was the last episode, and Voyager had caused me to ask that question so many times over the years.
Worst, Captain Janeway and Mark. Remember Mark? Captain Janeway's boring boyfriend back home? No? No reason you should. Best, Tom Paris and Bellana Torres. It's not that the journey of Tom and Bellana from shipmates to soulmates is a particularly well done piece of storytelling. It's above average for Voyager. And one of the few examples of anyone on that show getting some significant character development, but it's not outstanding. Yet, somehow, when I reflect on Tom and Bellana, I view them more as victims of bad writing rather than products of it. Like, they were characters on a show that produced an episode featuring their wedding, an event that had been built up for like two years at that point, only to reveal that the characters in that episode were duplicates, not the genuine Voyager crew. So then, when the creators of Voyager decided to have Tom and Bellana get married for real a year and a half later, so by that point it had been built up to for three and a half years, they opted to have the wedding take place off screen because they didn't want to repeat themselves because they'd already shown the Tom and Bellana duplicates getting married. How any of the regulars made it to the end of that show without quitting the profession of acting in frustration is beyond me. You survived, Tom and Bellana, and Robert and Roxanne, and I salute you. Enterprise! This will be quick because there aren't too many. Best, to Paul and Trip. Look at these two crazy kids. She's whip smart and pretty as a picture, and he's clean cut and sturdy as a cypress fence. If they can't make it work, well, heck, what hope do the rest of us have? What's that? It doesn't work out between them? Aw, that's too bad. I'm real sorry to... Oh, what's that again? Because he gets killed off in the last episode? Well, that's all right then, I suppose. Worst, Travis Mayweather and Gannett, Demons and Terra Prime. He's the senior helm officer of the Starship Enterprise. She's a reporter who's suspected of being a spy for space Nazis who turns out to actually be a spy for Starfleet. And look, I'm sure she's a wonderful person. She seems cool, but that's a lot. And I don't really need that in my life, so I'm going to pass. I'm Travis in this scenario, by the way, which you probably already assumed people confuse us all the time. The Kelvin Timeline Movies! Best, Spock and Uhura. Yeah, I know this is an example of the rebooted movies doing a, but this time it's different. Even though the Spock-Uhura thing doesn't come completely out of left field, there's some flirtation and the suggestion of an attraction between them in the early episodes of the original series, specifically The Man Trap and Charlie X, the first two episodes of Star Trek ever broadcast. It never goes anywhere after that? But even so, it's not like J.J. Abrams and Alex Kurtzman and Roberto Orsi just pulled it out of their asses. I like it because it creates a unique dynamic within this version of the original Enterprise crew. It lets us see a more personal and vulnerable side of Spock, and a stronger side of Uhura, because she seems to be the dominant one in the relationship. I dig that, because what's the point of doing a reboot of an established series if you're just going to do all the same stuff over again? Plus, when they go through a rough patch in Star Trek Beyond, it actually figures into the plot, instead of just being some contrived relationship angst, like when it looked like Kirk was thinking about breaking up with the Enterprise. At last we arrive in the current production era of the franchise, and Star Trek Discovery. Worst, Michael Burnham and Ash Tyler. She's the lead protagonist of the series who is blamed for starting a war with the Klingons and is assigned to the Starship Discovery as a kind of work release after doing time in prison for treason, and also she's Spock's human adopted sister. He's a Klingon spy surgically altered to appear human who also has the memories and personality of a human Starfleet officer implanted into his mind to make him the perfect sleeper agent for the Klingons to infiltrate Starfleet during a time of war. And my question is, how can two characters with those backstories combine to make a couple this goddamn dull? The first season of Discovery includes some serious missteps in its writing. If I had to name two, I'd say a terribly paced season-long serialized story that leans heavily on multiple game-changing reveals that don't quite land, and a visit to the Mirror Universe that derails the whole thing for several episodes. If I had to name three, 
I'd say banking even slightly on the audience being invested in the Michael Ash relationship because I don't give a shit about them. And as far as I'm concerned, Michael couldn't possibly have dumped him fast enough. Best, Paul Stamets and Hugh Culber. Well, it's about damn time. The first on-screen same-sex couple in Star Trek, a show dedicated to championing diversity and inclusion. And it only took... 51 years. And while there are some rough patches early on, Stamets and Culber briefly fall victim to the barrier gaze trope when Culber is killed off in season one. They, along with the rest of the show, figure things out in season two. Culber is resurrected thanks to the magic mushroom cosmic highway and become one of the most reliably compelling elements of Discovery, which, despite considerable growth and improvement, remains a jarringly uneven show. Stamets and Culber become interesting characters in their own rights, and together they form a portrait of a complex, loving, committed relationship. In season three, they even kind of sort of become parents. And speaking of that, best, Adira and Grey. Stamets and Culber have a pretty wild history, even for Star Trek characters. The whole one of us was murdered but came back to life thanks to a universe-spanning web of space fungus deal. Then, in season three, along comes Adira, like, cool story, hold my space beer. So, Adira has a boyfriend named Grey, and Grey is a trill, and Adira and Grey were on a ship that was hit by an asteroid and Grey was killed, and his trill belly slug, which contains all of his memories, plus those of all its previous hosts, was transplanted to Adira because Adira was the only available host, and the slug would have died otherwise. So now, Adira is the host for their own dead boyfriend. Only, he's not really dead because his consciousness survives in the belly slug. And also, Adira has visions of Grey where he appears as a separate person that only Adira can see and interact with. But it's not a hallucination. It's really Grey manifesting himself into the world through Adira's perception. Then, in season four, Grey's consciousness is psychically removed from the belly slug and placed into a new body, so now Adira's boyfriend no longer lives in their belly, but is once again a fully realized, separate, physical person. Beat that. Best, Burnham and Book. Michael Burnham's first relationship was a real snoozer, but once she made the jump to the 32nd century, along with the rest of the disco crew, things got a lot more interesting. Burnham is separated from the rest of the crew when she arrives, and within a few minutes, she meets Book. And unlike Ash Tyler, Book is actually, like, a character? With presence? Like, I want to watch him and see what he does? He's an environmentalist, he has an enormous cat to whom he's utterly devoted, he has a cool ship that can change its shape, and he has values that are righteous but that don't always align with Michael's commitment to Starfleet. They have adventures together, and they're fun, they experience pain and loss, and they're there for each other, they disagree, they separate, their feelings for one another endure, and they come back together. They make each other better as people and as characters, and they make the show better. And have I mentioned the cat? And now, because we must, let us move on to Star Trek Picard. Worst, Soji and Narek. A robot who doesn't know she's a robot, and a Romulan spy who does know she's a robot and has seduced her in order to insinuate himself into her life so that when she does remember she's a robot, he can find out where all the other robots live so the Romulans can go and kill the robots because Romulans don't like robots. I think it's meant to be suspenseful. Will Soji remember who and what she really is? Will Narek go through with his mission to use her to destroy her kind, or has he developed genuine feelings for her? But the writers forgot to put in the suspenseful parts. What we're left with is two very charismatic and attractive actors playing flat, uninteresting characters dancing around secrets and looming revelations that I honestly couldn't have given less of a shit about. And this was all before the show got really bad. Worst, Picard and Laris. Look, everybody, a love interest for Picard, who's only 20 years younger than Patrick Stewart. So the producers of Star Trek Picard and... I'm just guessing Patrick Stewart himself, had the idea to give Picard a love interest in season two. Then they made two bewilderingly bad decisions. One, they said, hey, let's make Picard's love interest Laris, his in-home aide. 
That won't be weird at all. Oh, that's right, she's married. Her husband was even a character on the show in season one. Well, let's just say he died sometime prior to the start of season two, because nothing can stand in the way of Picard and Laris. Their love will echo through the stars, and they must be free, free to love. Two, they said, hey, let's not have Laris be in the show very much. Let's have the main characters time travel and spend most of the season in the past, and Laris doesn't go along, and instead we have Picard meet a completely different character who just so happens to look exactly like Laris. And then they did that. Both of those decisions not only survived past the first story meeting where they were pitched, they actually made it into the show. Picard's romance with his live-in nurse slash housekeeper slash cook who suddenly wanted to jump his old man android bones came out of nowhere in the first episode of season two, was treated like an afterthought for most of the rest of the season, then suddenly became super important again in the last episode of the season. So important that it was the subject of the closing shot. It's the note on which the entire season concluded. And then, most hilariously of all, in the first episode of season three, she's written out almost immediately and never mentioned again. Because God forbid people who watch this show start to think that the things that happen in this show are more important than things that happened in another show that was on 30 years ago. But as unbelievable as it sounds, there is another couple in Star Trek Picard who might be even more randomly thrown together and even more fucked over by the writing than Picard and Laris. Worst, Seven and Raffi. I take no joy in this. Even with the long overdue queer representation in Star Trek Discovery, same-sex couples in Star Trek shows are in short supply, and I do wish that Seven and Raffi had worked out better. But the start of their relationship feels just as arbitrary and abrupt as Picard and Laris. They're briefly shown holding hands in a tracking shot at the very end of season one. And by the time we pick things up in season two, they're already separated. Not broken up exactly, but not not broken up either. Then they travel back in time and involve themselves in subplots that go nowhere and a car chase that goes nowhere and has no point. And they spend most of an episode just kind of standing around in an alley for some reason. And they seem to randomly swap personalities every so often, all of which makes it impossible to even feel like I know who they are, much less care about their relationship and what's going to become of it. By the end of the series' third and blessedly final season, they're back together, I guess, and Seven is the captain of the Enterprise for some reason, which used to be the Titan but was rechristened for some reason, and Raffi is Seven's first officer for some reason. So, yeah, maybe I misjudged this one. Apart from the facts that there's no reason for them to be a couple, and we hardly ever see them actually being a couple, and the show in which they are a couple is the worst Star Trek series ever produced... Seven and Raffi aren't so bad. Best, Riker and Troy. What a twist! I bet you thought I was just gonna shit on Star Trek Picard nonstop on account of how thoroughly awful it was from top to bottom. Well, let it never be said that I am unwilling to give credit where I feel it is due. For all the garbage the creators of Star Trek Picard churned out across three seasons, one minor miracle they managed to pull off was to take one of the laziest creative decisions from the worst Star Trek movie, fuck it, let's just have Riker and Troy get married, and redeem it to such an extent that it winds up being one of the few highlights of this wretched, misbegotten series. Riker and Troy first appear in the best episode of season one of Picard, Nepenthe, where they are living in mostly content relative isolation with their daughter. They are entirely absent from season two, the lucky bastards, and then they reappear to take part in season three's nonsensical orgy of fan service, only their stuff is almost all the best stuff. Thanks to career best performances from Jonathan Frakes and Marina Sirtis, in a season where more than ever characters are treated like prized collectibles to be displayed and reverently admired, Riker and Troy seem like real people in a real marriage who have lived a real life together who love each other and have loved each other for a long time. There's an authentic, comfortable, lived-in quality to their characterizations that most of the rest of the show sorely lacks. And while I don't want to see them anymore, Star Trek has done more than enough nostalgia touring, thank you very fucking much. At the very least, I didn't mind seeing them again this time. 
Strange new worlds, strange new worlds, strange new worlds. Best, Captain Pike and Captain Battelle. Some of Star Trek's best couples are people in committed monogamous relationships, married or at least together most of the time. Some are ships passing in the night, unforgettable but short-lived. And some are like Pike and Battelle, two attractive and available adults with an arrangement. They like each other, they care about each other, and whenever they're in the same place at the same time, they take time to make time, but with no strings attached. Until things between them start to get a little more serious in Season 2, that is, which I'm fine with. The Strange New Worlds version of Captain Pike has become one of my favorite characters in the whole damn franchise, and he could do a lot worse than Marie Battelle, who has also grown on me quite a bit throughout her several appearances. Whether they end up together for the long haul, or things end sadly because, for instance, one of them is torn apart from the inside out by alien dinosaur babies or to cite another completely hypothetical possibility, one of them is horrifically burned, confined to a beep chair, and ends up spending the rest of his life in a telepathically induced fantasy state. The important thing is they're together now, and they're interesting now. And just imagine how amazing the glad-to-be-alive sex is going to be, assuming they're both still alive after the cliffhanger from the end of Season 2 is resolved. Best, Spock and T'Pring. What a bright future these two must have together, huh? Aww. Sure, they have their issues to work through. Spock's commitment to Starfleet means they don't spend very much time together, and T'Pring's family is... a lot. And according to the Star Trek Short Short Holiday Party, which is definitely canon, I don't give a fuck what those uptight memory alpha nerds think, T'Pring has left Spock for other men on multiple occasions, but one, that last one is hilarious, and two, they're both intelligent, logical people. They understand the importance of balancing their personal needs and desires with the obligations imposed by their society and its culture, and they're just so much fun! Their relationship has provided the basis for two of the best episodes of Strange New Worlds, Season 1's Spock Amok and Season 2's Charades. I wish they would do a wacky Spock farce every year for as long as the show runs. Spock and T'Pring are a guaranteed win, a romantic comedy cosmic power couple. I hope they never break up. Best, Spock and Nurse Chapel. Although, here's how I know Spock and Nurse Chapel are a great couple. I want them to be together, even though I know they aren't going to end up together, because, for one thing, the show is a prequel to another show that takes place several years later, where they aren't together. And for another thing, even if it wasn't a prequel, it's pretty obvious that Spock and Christine are the lovers whose love is not to be, not the soulmates destined to share their lives forever. But the romantic tension between them is so compelling, their mutual attraction and feeling for each other is so palpable, and the chemistry between Ethan Peck and Jess Bush is so electrifying that I can't help but wish they could be together, even though I know it's better for the show that they aren't. Because I'm no longer thinking of them as characters in a work of fiction, but as real people. Real people who might be happy together, but never will be because they have the misfortune of being in such a good goddamn show. Goddamn, this has taken a while already, and there are still a ton of couples from all over the franchise I haven't even mentioned yet. So, let's do a lightning round. A randomized list of Star Trek couples I haven't talked about yet, sorted best or worst as fast as I can. Harry Kim and Libby, his girl back home, best. After getting lost in the Delta Quadrant, he would still wake up in the middle of the night screaming her name, so I'm guessing they liked each other. Captain Rios and Dr. Teresa Ramirez, worst. He decided to stay in the 21st century with her after they'd known each other about five minutes, and we learn he was eventually killed in a bar fight. Though on the other hand, it's still a better fate than having to live through another season of Star Trek Picard. Captain Janeway and Michael Sullivan, the hunky hologram guy from Fairhaven. Worst. Ask your pal Barkley about falling in love with holograms, Kathy. Although, credit where it's due, delete the wife is one of the best lines of the entire series. Counselor Troy and Devanani Rao from The Price. Worst. Really, Deanna? Why couldn't you find a nice, respectable guy? Like Lloyd Braun. 
Scotty and Lieutenant Romaine from The Lights of Zatar. Worst, Scotty has the hots for Romaine, but he doesn't take her seriously when she tells him she's seeing visions of the future. He's a bad boyfriend. Uhura, you dodged a bullet, baby. Q and Lady Q from The Q and the Grey. Worst, she gets knocked up after they touch tips, and then Q gets stuck with the baby? The hell is that? Dr. Bashir and Serena, who was cataleptic until Bashir cured her. Worst. Doctors shouldn't date their patients, especially when the patients are naive, emotionally fragile, and just gained the ability to speak and interact with their environment yesterday. Saru and Tarina, the president of Volculus in Star Trek Discovery. Best. Saru deserves only happiness, and Tarina seems like someone who will treat him right, and she goddamn well better or she'll have to deal with me. Captain Picard and Lieutenant Commander Nella Darren from Lessons. Best. They bonded over music and seemed like a good match for each other. I don't give a shit about the captain dating a subordinate thing in this context because they're both adults and I'm not their HR rep. Dr. Crusher and Riker, the temporary trill host from The Host. Worst. Just let Beverly fuck Riker, you cowards. You know she wants to. Everybody wants to. Narek and Nerissa, Star Trek Picard's Romulan incest twins. Worst. This is Star Trek, not flowers in the attic. Dr. Crater and the Salt Vampire from The Man Trap. Worst. That Salt Vampire was way too needy. Worf and Bael, the half-Klingon, half-Romulan chick at the prison camp from Birthright Part 2. Worst. She's too young for you, Worf. Who do you think you are, Patrick Stewart? Kevin and Rashawn from The Survivors. Best. She died and he used his godlike powers to wipe out every single member of the species of her killers. Where I come from, we call that love. Dr. McCoy and Yeoman Barrows from Shore Leave. Worst. She thinks he's dead and then moments after she sees him brought back to life, she gets jealous of the chorus girls escorting him. She clearly doesn't trust him. But on the other hand, she's probably gonna fuck him real good that night. Vosh and Q from Q-less. Worst. Q's a bad boyfriend, okay? Gul Dukat and Kai win. Best. Nice to see them both finally happy, isn't it? Scotty and Lieutenant Palamas from Who Mourns for Adonias. Worst. Face it, Scotty, she's just not that into you. Maybe you can catch her on the rebound from Apollo, but for her sake, I hope not. Lest we forget, you're also a bad boyfriend. Luoxana Troy and Timison from Half a Life. Best. They're good enough together that I almost don't hate Loaxana for an entire episode. And then Timison opts for death over a relationship with her, which is the objectively correct choice. Dr. Bashir and Melora from the episode Melora. Worst. She has a chip on her shoulder over being unable to walk unassisted in standard gravity, and he acts like an entitled prick with a touch of God complex to her. I don't think it was ever going to work out. To Prill and Savette, to Pring's parents from Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Worst, she's judgmental and domineering, and he's a spineless doormat, though those qualities do make them absolutely delightful players in a farce. Chekhov and Sylvia from Spectre of the Gun. Worst, was a pretend girl really worth getting pretend killed over, Pavel? Kirk and Marlena from Mirror Mirror. Worst. He's not really her Kirk. And then when he gets back home, he sees his universe's version of Marlena. And he's like, hey, we've got one too. All right. You're better than that, Jim. That's some Scotty level shit. Ezri and Worf. Best. I'm not going to judge. Yes, it's a little weird that Worf was married to Jadzia, Ezri's previous host. And yes, there is an age gap, but they're both adults and they had to get it out of their systems and they did and they moved on. So good for them. What do you want from me? Wesley and Robin Leffler from The Game. Best. They make a good team, they save the ship from addictive mobile gaming, and Wesley doesn't immediately run in the opposite direction when he realizes she has a numbered list of rules which she has named after herself, and she doesn't immediately run in the opposite direction when she realizes he's Wesley. So they must really like each other. Kraft and Zora from the short trek Calypso. Best. It's a beautiful, melancholy love story about two lost souls who find one another and are able to give each other's lives meaning for a short time. We should all be so lucky. I find it so moving, I didn't even write a joke about it. And not because I couldn't think of one, because I could have, I just didn't want to. Sulu and Mr. Sulu? Apparently, according to the end credits, his name is Ben. Anyway, from Star Trek Beyond. Best. Sulu's cool, Ben. 
seems cool also. And they're in Star Trek Beyond, and pretty much everything in that movie is awesome. Khan and Lieutenant MacGyver's from Space Seed. Worst, you don't fuck fascists, Marla. You just don't. It's against the rules. I don't know if it's a Leffler's Law, but you know what? It shouldn't need to be. Jake Sisko and Marta. Best. Jake's dad doesn't approve at first, but he comes around because Jake's old enough to make his own decisions, and she's a nice young lady. Plus, she's a Dabo girl, so you know she's probably got some walking around money, which is good because we know when they go out to dinner, Jake ain't picking up the check. He's a human. He doesn't have any money. Quark and Grilka. Best. Quark almost gets himself hacked to pieces at the hands of Klingons in order to impress her not once but twice, and she clearly digs him because she neither kills him nor has him killed. Gerardi and Bruce Maddox from Star Trek Picard. Worst. The only bit of their relationship that isn't backstory is when she murders him. And I know you can blame the visions she got from the Romulans, but come on, if I really loved someone, I wouldn't murder them, no matter how many possible future robot apocalypses they might be indirectly responsible for. Kirk and Lenore from The Conscience of the King, worst. Too much of a power imbalance for it to ever work out. He's a starship captain whom she describes as Caesar of the Stars, and she's a humble actor and secret murderous psychopath. I think Lenore would be happier with someone of a lower rank than captain. Like, say, maybe an ensign. Captain Janeway and Jaffin from Workforce. Best. Jaffin is a good partner for Janeway, supporting her while still standing up for himself, proving that he is a dependable, ethical, and honest man, unlike his weak-willed, duplicitous brother Stanley. Harry Kim and Darren Tall from The Disease. Worst. She gives him a space STD that causes him to develop the most dangerous infection of all. Love. Dr. McCoy and the Salt Vampire from the Man Trap. Worst. That's not Nancy, Doctor. If that was Nancy, could she take the beating Spock was putting on her? And would you still have found it so erotic? Loxana Troy and Odo. Worst. Why is Loxana Troy on Deep Space Nine? She has no reason to be there even once, let alone three times. Oh, she becomes infatuated with Odo? Do you not see how that makes it worse? Captain Sisko and Jennifer from the Mirror Universe. Worst. You've got a type, Ben, I'll give you that. Women named Jennifer, who meet you and then wind up dead. Anything you'd like to tell us? Captain Rios and Gerardi, worst. I know it seems like she's into you, Rios, but trust me, she's just rebounding after murdering her last boyfriend. It's just as well that it didn't work out, though, since in season two, you're both written out of the series in the most shit-witted ways imaginable. Dr. Flox and Crewman Cutler, best. I don't know if they ever even actually had sex, but if they did, I can only imagine Flox gave Cutler a good time. I've seen that dude's tongue. Counselor Troy and Aaron Connor from the Masterpiece Society, worst. Has forbidden love ever been this boring? I withdraw the question. Lieutenant La'an Noonien Singh and Lieutenant James Kirk from Star Trek Strange New Worlds. Best. Oh, it's another Spock and Nurse Chapel deal. The characters who should be together, but can't be because of reasons. I'm such a sucker for that. I just love it when characters I like are prevented from leading happy and fulfilling lives. Seven of Nine and Axum, her Borg boyfriend from Unimatrix Zero. Worst. Even for a Borg drone, he's a bit of a stiff, ain't he? I guess when it comes to dudes, Seven has a type too. Captain Picard and Dr. Crusher, best. Hey, this is the last one, and I get to end on a positive note. They were the ultimate will-they-or-won't-they couple from TNG, and then in the third season of Picard, it went from will-they-or-won't-they to they did at some point. I'll overlook the fact that the latter portion of their relationship is a shamelessly lazy lift from Kirk and Carol in Star Trek II because the first episode of Season 3 is full of shamelessly lazy lifts from Star Trek II, so why single them out? Oh yeah, I wanted to end on a positive note, didn't I? Um, they didn't get to grow old together, but now they get to be old together. And hey, a love interest for Picard, who's less than 10 years younger than Patrick Stewart. I think that's as good as we're ever going to get on that one. Even after all that, I'm sure I left out somebody, so please feel free to share any favorites of yours that I didn't mention in the comments. Happy Valentine's Day! 
to all of you who are celebrating, whether you're in a couple, or a thruple, or a fourple, or it's just you but you really like flowers and chocolate, whoever you are, whoever you're with, wherever in the space-time continuum you might be, no! No! Get away from her! She is two years old! You're gross! You're, you're a gross space warthog man! Go hang out with someone else! That's better. Oh, what, you sickos? Kess was gone by then. They'd rehabbed his character. It's perfectly innocent. I can't believe you would even... Naomi, honey, how you doing? You all right? You just gonna watch Flodder with Neelix for a while while you wait to see if your mom's alive or dead? Okay. See, it's fine. She's fine. You just give a yell if you need help with anything at all. Hey folks, I hope you enjoyed this one. I'm gonna let you know what the subject of the next Trek Actually video is gonna be, but before I do that, I wanna give shout outs to some of my newest Patreon patrons and channel members. First, the new patrons, they are Jacob Duchesne, thanks Jacob. Michael Gregg, thanks Michael. T Dolan, thanks T. Me Handlebars, thanks Me Handlebars. Martin White, thanks Martin. Albert Lee, thanks Albert. Krush Wayfair, thanks Krush. And now, for the new channel members. They are Brian Baker, thanks Brian. Accidentally Derivative, thanks Accidentally Derivative. Chris Connett, thanks Chris. Drunken Warlock Entertainment Inc., thanks Drunken Warlock Entertainment Inc. James Nesbitt, thanks James. If you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash steveshives or clicking the join button to become a member of this channel. All patrons and members get access to exclusive posts that allow you to vote in the polls that determine upcoming Trek Actually topics, and also submit questions ahead of time for my twice-monthly Ask Away live streams. If you pledge $5 a month or more on Patreon, or become a member at the 5 bucks a month tier or higher, you get a shout-out at the end of a Trek Actually video. If you'd rather give a one-time gift than a recurring monthly contribution, you're always more than welcome to do that by clicking the thanks button right below the video or via PayPal or Venmo. The links for those are in the video description. Many thanks. If you like what I do on YouTube, especially the Star Trek related stuff, you should also check out my side projects. The Ensign's Log, the Star Trek themed comedy podcast that I'm on alongside Jason Harding and Dana Cole, and Trek Reluctantly, the watch-along stream Dana and I do every Wednesday starting at 6 p.m. Eastern on this channel right here. As always, links in the description. Now, for next month's Regulation Trek Actually topic, these past couple of episodes have been somewhat epic, as epic as videos centered on a dude sitting in a chair talking about Star Trek can be, we have spanned the franchise from the very beginning to the present day and examined dozens of characters across every iteration of Star Trek, and it's been a lot of fun. But next month, next month I'm going back to what put Trek actually on the map, and it's there. Trust me, it's just a little speck. You have to zoom in a few times to get a good look at it, but it's on the map, okay? I'm going to focus on one character from one Trek show and try to elucidate what makes them so compelling. That character, as chosen by a majority of my patrons and members who voted in the most recent topic poll, is Major Kira of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which means the topic of next month's video is why Major Kira is actually Deep Space Nine's most complicated hero. That's next month. I'll be back then and a bunch of times before then, so until the next time you see me, whenever that is, thanks for watching and take care, everybody.